And this has now gone into clinical trials, and we've actually completed the, the phase one, two clinical trial. And a product's been developed that's called Sethrin. This is a C3 recombinant a protein. It's the world's first recombinant protein tested in man that targets nerve cell regeneration. And the approach that we developed kind of as a first phase tissue engineering approach is to try to take advantage of techniques that neurosurgeons use all the time to try to seal rents in the tissue and so on. This is um, using a molecule called, called Tissial. And so I'll just show you kind of in a movie form the concept here. So, so let's say I have a patient with an acute spinal cord injury. I've decompressed the spinal cord. I now have access to the spinal cord. We can now, as a final phase of the operation, deliver the sethrin uh, around the injured spinal cord, and it will penetrate the injured spinal cord, block these uh, deleterious pathways that are activated by Rho with a view to try, trying to improve function. And so then this is what, we, what we've taken forward. And so we've done this in what's called a phase one, two study. What, what does that mean? So there's a developmental pathway in clinical trials as well established. A phase one trial is a safety study you're trying to see, is it safe, is it feasible to do? That's the first step. A phase two study goes a bit beyond that, um, where you, you may be getting some sense of efficacy. And then the final step is the phase three study, which is where you have the definitive, the definitive efficacy. So this is kind of the initial two steps, if you will. And so what we did here was we took patients who had a very severe spinal cord injury. We initially started with people who had a thoracic injury, and then we moved into people with a cervical injury. We started in the thoracic area because we thought, well, we didn't know whether there might be some side effects, and we thought, well, it might have fewer complications there. As it turned out, this was a very safe approach. And then we had to do this in a dose escalation a study, and then by escalating the doses, you can, see, you can really see as you look at the recovery curves, are you getting some kind of a dose response? And, 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 um, and then what was required after each one of these phases of the study, we had to submit the data to an independent audit. And this is, was done under FDA uh, uh, scrutiny as well as under uh, Health Canada scrutiny. So a fairly rigorous study design. And we've enrolled 37 uh, patients. We have now over two-year follow-up, and we've now submitted this for publication, and we'll be moving forward in the trials. So, now, the safety study showed that it was very safe, and it was, it was uh, quite feasible to do. But these, this is where we started getting quite excited, and this is where we started looking at some of the recovery curves. And so um, these are motor scores, and what we're clearly seeing here is that there's a dose response effect. So this is what the control curves look like. So we normally do see some recovery that occurs. And in fact, that's extremely well worked out. It's on, normally patients will recover about 14 points on a 100 point scale. We're seeing about two and a half fold higher rates of recovery at three milligrams, and then it starts tapering off. And that's not surprising either, because you start running into potentially some of the to more you know, toxic effects of, of the drug. And I'll just show you a movie, and this is a person I looked after, and I was mentioning this to some folks just over coffee at the beginning. You know, why, why do I choose spinal cord injury? What are the implications for other people? So, so firstly, spinal cord injury it, it, it's, a, it's clearly a, a, a serious condition. It has devastating side effects for individuals. Exp it's expensive. I, we mentioned all of that, and, and many of you have been touched by this. But in addition, it has many, many benefits as a researcher if I'm trying to take therapies forward into the brain and the spinal cord. Firstly, we know the cause. It's caused by an injury. So unlike other types of conditions where we don't even know the cause, we know this. It's a one-time event. So unlike conditions, let's say, like multiple sclerosis, where there are many hits that can occur, we know there's one event. So in terms of trying to understand this, this becomes important. And it generally tends to affect young people, or does it? So here is a 64-year-old individual, and it turns out that the epidemiological data in Ontario and elsewhere in westernized societies are, in fact, showing that the most common individual with a spinal cord injury is in late middle age. 
It's the baby boomer phenomenon. People are active, people are healthier. And this is one of the things that has just taken governments by complete surprise, is that the rates of injury are much, much higher than previously expected. So here's a person, I'll tell you his story and I'll show you his video. So this is a, a um, when I looked after him, 64 year old gentleman, I have his permission to show the video. And he fell down, he's a shopkeeper. He fell down the stairs and was closing up his shop and he broke his neck. And he was up against the window or the, of, of, of the door and he couldn't move anything below his neck, he was paralyzed. They found him the next morning, he was close to cardiac arrest and he, couldn't, he could barely even move his head. And he came into the intensive care unit and I was asked to, to see him and I wasn't even sure whether he was going to live. And we were able to, to, uh, uh, to resuscitate him and fortunately he didn't have a brain injury. But there we were, we were with a 64 year old man. Uh, 20 years ago we would have said, oh there's nothing that you can do for that individual. You know, he's over 60, you can't do anything. But, but you know, techniques have changed, attitudes have changed. And so in fact we, we decided to bring him into the, the, the clinical trial protocol, we gave him Sethrin. And this is what he looks like at a year. So the first thing you'll see is he's now moving his hands and his arms and he can actually hold a cup of water and he can, uh, he can drink. This is a man who couldn't even hold his head up, he had no movement. He has recovered any gravity function in the legs. Um, he has some spasticity and clonus in the lower, in the lower, um, in the lower limbs. And you'll see in a moment that he's recovered significant trunk control. You see how he can shift himself in the chair. And so this is quite important, in ter quite important in terms of independence. And that's his son standing at his right side. He's going to help him stand. And there he is, he's standing. At two years now he's actually walking uh, with, uh, uh, with, 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 uh, with, with canes. And the, the statistics or the epidemiological data would say that this doesn't ever occur. You don't see people at five days who have an Asia AC4 injury recover to what's called an Asia D level where they're walking. And so this is potentially the miracle of a combined treatment approach uh, of the best available medical care of surgical intervention with a regenerative type of, uh, type of a molecule. So it's one thing to show the, the graphs and the curves and the statistics, but sometimes showing this kind of a clinical vi vignette We'll, we'll, we'll show you what this actually means. So this is now being moved forward into uh, a phase three clinical trial and this is an example of where we have partnered with, uh, with, with, with industry. I showed you before an example with um, really is all where we were doing this really with public, uh, with public funding and really we need a combined approach with regard uh, to this to try to tackle this, this problem. So here again we have the clinical vignette, the dilemma. I've talked about the different types of approaches. In reality to treat this a gentleman who's had really a, a, a terrible injury, we're trying to get the best outcome that we can for this individual. So this person did have uh, early surgery. We were able to save his life. He got out of the intensive care unit. He got off the ventilator. Uh, he's now at home in the community but he has been left with significant uh, a deficit and as we move forward we may be able to use some of these uh, regenerative approaches for individuals such as this. And there's a lot going on uh, around the world with regard to various clinical trials with various types of approaches but I think you'll find it reassuring to know that in spinal cord injury we recognize the need for the globalization of research. In fact, we'll be hosting in 2010, probably in this very auditorium, a global consensus conference we've called the Global Blueprint for the Translation of Stem Cell Research uh, into Man and we are literally going to be engaging uh, uh, the world in terms of how to try to tackle this, this, uh, this, this problem. And here I've mentioned a number of, of, the, of the trials that are ongoing and for sake of time I haven't been able to touch on, on every uh, single strategy but this is, this is arguably the most exciting area in neuroscience right now. The idea that we actually can repair and regenerate the injured nervous system and with that I'll close and thank you very much.